good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming out, as always. You are the smartest, most beautiful, most well-rounded, just best people uh, in the entire United States. <laughs> the universe, let's say that. Um, but, as always, we're grateful for you coming out, spending your Friday nights with us uh, for our public lecture series. Uh, I am Matt Wood, and I am very delighted to introduce Dr. Sukanya Chakrabarti. She is from Florida Atlantic University. I gave a talk down there in October, and she graciously volunteered to come up and give us a talk here. She gave our colloquium this afternoon. Now she's going to give a public talk. She got her uh, PhD degree from Berkeley, then was an NSF fellow, very prestigious uh, position to have at Harvard had another postdoc back at Berkeley, and in 2011 joined Florida Atlantic University where she is a rising star. And uh, with, uh, without further ado, Dr. Chakrabarty, thank you. Thanks, Matt, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. Well, as advertised, I am gonna be talking about the dark side of the universe. Well, actually, I'm going to try and tell you what the universe is made of. So these days, we can get stunning images of galaxies both nearby and distant. And uh, this is an image of the antennae system of galaxies that have undergone a very violent collision, resulting in a very intense starburst that you see traced out here. And of course, we know about constellations like this one and planets, uh, like in our own solar system. These are the things that we can see very easily, and we're even discovering extrasolar planets by the dozen. But if you take a closer look, it turns out that these things that we can see very easily are only a very small fraction of the known universe, about 5%. The rest of the universe is made up of dark matter and dark energy, in this talk, I'll try and uh, explain to you what we know about dark matter. I won't be talking about the other uh, bulk of the universe uh, that's believed to be composed of dark energy. Uh, we infer those from observations of supernovae. You can ask me later about that if you're interested. But this talk will be focused on the dark matter slice of the pie. So since I've told you this pretty crazy thing, I've told you that most of the visible uh, universe is made up of stuff that we can't see. I feel like I owe you some kind of explanation. I should at least tell you how do we know that dark matter exists? How do we infer that it exists? And uh, once I've addressed that existential problem, I'll try and tell you how we can figure out where it is and uh, how we can characterize it in more detail. But I'd first like to um, introduce some nomenclature so that we're all on the same page. This is an image of the Orion constellation. It's the nearest region of massive star formation. It's about 400 parsec away, which is about 1,200 light years. Uh, the parsec is a typical distance between stars. It's a huge number in centimeters, so we use a new unit to uh, talk about astronomical distances. As you can see, we're going to be talking about very large uh, lens scales. Um, now, the typical uh, size of a spiral galaxy over which the stars are distributed is a few kiloparsec, OK? So this is the distance beyond which the density of stars drops off exponentially. It drops off very fast beyond about a few kiloparsec. The other uh, basic fact that we'll need to know in the course of this talk is that galaxies are multi-component systems. They're made up of gas, stars, and dark matter. The sound speeds of the cold gaseous component is a lot less than the effective sound speeds of the stellar component. And colder things are more responsive to gravitational perturbations and can serve as an, a very effective tracer of gravitational interactions with dark matter dominated dwarf galaxies. And you'll see later on in the course of the talk how we use, uh, how we analyze observed disturbances in the outskirts of the gas disks of galaxies to characterize dark matter dominated dwarf galaxies. 
But before I get into that, I wanted to talk a little bit about the history of dark matter. The um, contemporary hunt for dark matter has a lot in common with the hunt for planets back in the 1800s. In the 1800s, this guy, this handsome guy, Le Verrier, analyzed disturbances in the orbits of the then known planet Uranus. And he made the hypothesis that they were due to a yet unseen planet. And he was able to calculate the azimuth of that planet, now known as Neptune, to within a degree. This was a huge success of Newtonian mechanics at the time. And as far as I know, it's the first example of the discovery of an essentially dark object simply from analysis of its gravitational effects on another body. I mention this because this is one of the ways that we're trying to characterize dark matter dominated dwarf galaxies by analyzing their gravitational signatures on the larger spiral galaxy that they're interacting with. So I'm now going to fast forward from the 1800s to the 70s. Um, the 70s produced uh, some very significant um, observational results that influenced our understanding of dark matter on galactic scales. So in the 70s, uh, there were some classic papers that were written that showed that the rotation curves of galaxies continue to be flat out to large distances. Okay, this is, you're going around and you're measuring the circular speed of stuff in a galaxy. And if you were to, you know, you can just go and look at a typical spiral galaxy like this one and you can measure the stellar surface density. Okay, and the stellar surface density drops off like uh, e to the minus r over rd, where rd is the scale length that I mentioned earlier. It's a few kiloparsec in typical spirals. So beyond a few scale length, the density of stars drops off very, very fast. So our expectation, simply from looking at the material, the visible material the, 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 in, that, that we have in stars, was that the rotation curve should drop off beyond a few kpc, because there are no stars very far out. Okay, so a few kpc is about here. But these curves continue to be flat out to distances that are large compared to the scale length. And because of this, we infer an unseen uh, dark matter component. Okay, this unseen dark matter halo is believed to be producing these flat rotation curves. So the basic composition of a typical galaxy, now looking at it face on here and looking at it edge on, uh, about, there's about 10 to the 11 stars in a typical galaxy. There's about 10 to the 10 solar masses of gas, but most of the mass is in this uh, uns, you know, inferred uh, dark matter component making up about 10 to the 12 solar masses in a typical spiral galaxy. Another uh, means that we have of learning about and inferring dark matter is from gravitational lensing. The idea is that very massive objects can deflect light rays. Okay, so the light, the light rays from a background galaxy are deflected by an intervening galaxy cluster, causing these rays to be bent on the way to us, producing these kind of really extraordinary uh, arcs and multiple images. So this is the geometry here. There's an intervening galaxy cluster, and the light from a background galaxy is deflected on its way to us. It turns out that the geometry of gravitational lensing can be reproduced by a very simple demo with a wine glass and a candle. If you there we go. If, we, if you get the alignment just right, okay, and you have to experiment a little bit, um, but if you get the alignment just right, you'll be able to see these arcs and multiple images. And uh, you're welcome to come up and uh, try this for yourself uh, later on. Now, dark matter and stars 
are collisionless. That is, you can evolve their dynamical state forward by treating them as if they were part of a smooth gravitational field. And they're not directly affected by a collision like gases. And this was uh, shown uh, very directly by observations of the bullet cluster, which show uh, the merging of a galaxy cluster. The uh, red is showing you the hot X-ray emitting gas, and the blue is a reconstructed mass map from gravitational lensing. And the offset of these two components shows you that dark matter is collisionless because it's not slowed down like the gases by, the, by this very violent collision. So we can now start to answer a little bit um, this first question. How do we know that dark matter exists? You know, it's, we infer its existence from its gravitational effect, and this is very similar to you know, looking at tides on the Earth's ocean from, from the moon, for instance. Okay, because dark matter doesn't uh, emit electromagnetic radiation, we can't see it uh, directly in the same way that we can see atoms. But it is massive, so we can nonetheless characterize it to some extent and figure things out about it by looking at its gravitational effect. Okay, and gravity will dictate how things move, so this is what we saw when we were looking at the rotation curves, when we were looking at the circular speed of stuff in a galaxy. This led us to infer that there is this additional uh, massive component that we needed to explain the flat rotation curves, and also with gravitational lensing. So now I'm going to go on to the uh, second question, which is, can we figure out where it is? So now I'm going to uh, talk about uh, some work that I've done recently with my collaborators to characterize dark matter dominated dwarf galaxies. The basic idea here is to analyze disturbances in the outskirts of galaxies, uh, like this one here. I'm showing an image here of the atomic hydrogen map of a nearby spiral galaxy called M51. It's also called the Whirlpool Galaxy. So this is showing you the density distribution in the nearby Whirlpool Galaxy. And the idea is by analyzing these kind of disturbances on the outskirts of galaxies in the, in the cold gaseous component, you can actually quantitatively characterize galactic satellites. That is, you can figure out how massive these satellites are and where they are in radius and azimuth. The reason this is of current importance in astronomy is that many of these dwarf galaxies are called dwarf galaxies because they're a lot smaller than our own galaxy. They're, say, something like 1 100th the mass of our own galaxy or even smaller. Okay, many of these dwarf galaxies are very dark matter dominated. They emit very little optical light. So it's useful to have an alternate method of characterizing them that doesn't rely on the optical light that they emit because they're extremely dim. Now, I want to emphasize that the disturbances that we're analyzing are well on the outskirts of galaxies. They're at the very edges of galaxies. The scale here is about 100 kiloparsec. The optical radius is here where much of the stellar emission is coming from. So these structures, the, these kind of disturbances that you see in the gas density distribution, they're at the very edge of the galaxy where it's much more likely to have been produced by an external perturber like a satellite, rather than from some intrinsic process like stellar spiral arms churning the gas, because there are no stellar spiral arms so all the way out there to churn the gas like this. So I'm first going to talk about applying this new method to galaxies like N51 that have known optically visible companions, because in these cases we can go back and check if we got the answer right. And as you'll see, we, we do pretty well for these cases. So that amounts to the proof of principle of the method. And then uh, I'm going to talk about the initial observations and analysis um, of the uh, disturbances in the outskirts of our own galaxy. So this is the atomic hydrogen map of our own galaxy. And you see that there are these structures 
uh, on the outskirts of our galaxy. The solar circle is here. Okay, so to explain why these structures arose, uh, we started to develop this method to see if these structures arise from a yet-to-be-discovered satellite of our own galaxy. Um, and then I'm going to talk about uh, recent work that builds on the sequence of papers to infer the distribution of dark matter in the primary spiral galaxy itself. So in the 80s, the, it was shown that the cold dark matter paradigm successfully reproduces the large-scale distribution of galaxies, that is, on megaparsec scales. Now, the idea here is that you're starting out from very smooth initial conditions that have small ripples that grow ultimately through gravity to produce the galaxies and galaxy clusters that you see today. This is a movie from the Millennium simulation that was done with about 10 to the 10 uh, particles to represent the structure of the universe. If you were to take a slice through this virtual universe, so this is the universe on the computer. If you were to take a slice through this virtual universe, this is what it would look like. The dots here, each dot here is a galaxy, okay? And you can compare it to the actual observed universe. That's what it is shown here in the blue. And you can see that there's a good level of agreement statistically between theory and observation. And this is one of the reasons this overall statistical agreement between the large-scale distribution of galaxies and the cold dark matter paradigm and what we really actually observe uh, in the real universe, not just the universe on the computer, but the real universe. This is one of the reasons why this paradigm came to be seen as successful. However, when we look at things on galactic and subgalactic scales, that is, not just megaparsec scales, but zoom in on one galaxy. That's what is being shown here in this movie. This is a movie from the Via Lactea simulation. It's a cosmological simulation of a galaxy like our own. These condensations that you see here are dark subhalos that are analogous to dim dwarf galaxies. It was zooming in from about 1,000 kiloparsec scales to 40 kiloparsec scales. You can compare this distribution of subhalos or dim dwarf galaxies to what we actually observe in our local neighborhood. So this is showing you the number of dwarf galaxies in the simulations in the solid colored lines compared with what we observe for dwarf galaxies in our local neighborhood. And you can see that there is a very large discrepancy here. Okay. And this discrepancy has come to be known as the missing satellites problem because the theorists expected to see many more dwarf galaxies than are actually observed. So in this context, it's interesting to ask the question, well, where are all the rest? Where are all the other dwarf galaxies that the theorists expected to see but didn't see? And the question specifically that I'm going to try and ask and try to answer is, can you find these things by looking for their gravitational signatures on the outer gas disks of galaxies. Now recently there has been a survey, a very, very sensitive survey done to look for dwarf galaxies um, by the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And this shows you the uh, known distribution of dwarf galaxies in yellow. And when you compare the, the known distribution to what is uh, predicted, the number of predicted faint satellites and the number of predicted dark satellites, you can see that even though we're discovering many more, uh, by the way, Sloan uh, more than doubled um, the number of dwarf galaxies in the years that it was operating, um, there are still many that we haven't yet seen. Um, we've now discovered dwarf galaxies that are as faint as a single star cluster, so this is really redefining what we mean by a galaxy. But there's still many that could possibly be there and are still undiscovered. Now, uh, there are well-known dwarf galaxies like the Large Magellanic Cloud, 
We've known about this one, oh, since the 1500s. It was discovered by Magellan back in the 1500s. Um, it's about 1 100th the mass of our own galaxy. It's quite gas rich. Um, the Sagittarius dwarf galaxy, it's the nearest known most massive dwarf galaxy uh, in, uh, that is a satellite of our own galaxy. It's a much older system. This is uh, what our galaxy would look like if you were to view it edge on. This was where the large Magellanic Cloud would be, and the, as the small Magellanic Cloud is about here. There's a faint streamer here um, that is tidal debris left over as the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy was eaten up as it was interacting with the Milky Way. So this is an act of sort of ga galactic cannibalism. So we do know, I mean, we know about some dwarf galaxies in our, in our local group, but there, it's a possibility that there may be many more that are waiting to be discovered. Now, the idea behind my work is, you know, the, as I said, galaxies are multi-component systems. They're made up of gas, stars, and dark matter, but it's the coldest component of a galaxy that is the most responsive. And as you saw, the uh, extended atomic hydrogen gas disks of galaxies, they are in fact very, very extended. They go out to distances that are very large compared to the optical radius. Okay, so they present a large cross-section for interaction. The other reason why gas is a great tracer of gravitational interactions is that gas has short-term memory. Disturbances in the gas disk dissipate on the order of a dynamical time, leaving you a clean slate. In contrast, disturbances in the stellar disk last for many crossing times, which makes the interpretation a little bit more difficult. So you can really maximize uh, your interpretation of uh, these kind of disturbances by looking for the footprints of dark subhalos, if you will, on the atomic hydrogen maps of spiral galaxies. There was a recent survey done that produced uh, atomic hydrogen maps of local spiral galaxies, very badly named, the Things Survey, the H1 nearby galaxy survey. Don't ask me how they came up with that name. Um, but actually, it was recently proposed that there should be a big things survey along with a little things survey. So that's a good idea. Um, so let me first uh, look at um, a, a couple here that have known optical companions. So this is the optical image of M51, also called the Whirlpool Galaxy. And you can see that it has a satellite sitting close to the tip of the short arm here. And this is the atomic hydrogen map that, that is showing you the cold gas distribution. And the satellite of M51 would sit here. It has no uh, uh, H1 or atomic hydrogen, but that is where it would sit if it had any. Um, and the idea is, you know, we're going to be analyzing this kind of disturbance in the outskirts of the gas disk to characterize you know, to see if we can characterize M51 satellite. I mean, in this case, we know that M51 has a known optically visible satellite. So this is like the proof principle um, of the method. And specifically, we do this by uh, doing a set of computer simulations of an M51-like spiral galaxy interacting with a satellite and comparing the resultant gas surface density of the simulations to uh, these observations. That's our specific metric of comparison to determine which simulations best fit the data. The movie that's running shows you uh, the gas density response as M51 is interacting with its satellite. And on the top here, I'm showing the gas density images from one of the best fit simulations. At the time when you have the best fit to the Fourier amplitudes, which is around here, uh, you know, and you can see that you have a good match visually to the morphology, okay, between the simulations here and the data. Uh, and I've marked also with cross as the center of the primary galaxy and the location of the satellite. And this is, you know, you know, you can see right away that at this time the satellite in the simulation is sitting very close to the tip of the short arm, as it does in the real system. Um, so I showed a uh, 3D stereoscopic rendering of this, you know, with the glasses and everything like you sometimes see in the movie theaters. 
at a press conference I did about a year ago, but uh, I don't have that equipment here with me today, so the, the uh, standard 2D will have to suffice. So as you can see, the, the basic idea here is uh, very similar to, you know, in terms of inferring the satellite mass and location, it's, it's basically like, say, dropping pebbles in a pond, okay? And by looking at the kind of ripples that form, you might be able to figure out how massive that pebble was, if you understood the physics well enough. Okay, so it's a very similar idea. Now, M51 has a pretty massive satellite. So we wanted to um, test this method on a galaxy that has a much smaller satellite, because in fact it's the, the very small galaxies that are the dimmest. So we want to check if it works for that case also. And uh, this, this galaxy here, NGC 1512, had a much smaller satellite, about 1 100th. It is optically visible, and it turns out the method works uh, quite well for this case also. So now I'm going to go back and uh, talk about the initial um, observations and analysis that began the development of this method. This is the raw H1 uh, atomic hydrogen map of our galaxy. This is the unsharp mass image, which means that you've gone around in an azimuth and divided by the median, which allows you to heighten low surface brightness features. And you can see these perturbations emerge on the outskirts. The scale here is going from minus 30 kiloparsec to 30 kiloparsec. And again, you can look at the Fourier amplitudes of the gas surface density that I'm showing here relative to the axis symmetric. And you can see that the low order Fourier amplitudes are of order 20 to 30% in the outskirts. And you wouldn't expect this level of perturbation in a purely isolated galaxy, well outside the region where stellar spiral arms can churn the gas. You're, you're on the very outskirts of our galaxy here. Okay, so when we saw this, we had to ask the question, what caused these structures well outside the solar circle? So I started doing a set of simulations of a Milky Way-like galaxy that was interacting with effectively dark satellites. This is showing you the gas response as our galaxy is interacting with a dark satellite, and this is showing you the stellar response. And I did a large parameter space survey, okay? So I varied how massive these satellites are from pretty low mass satellites that are one one thousandth the mass of our own galaxy to pretty massive satellites. I varied how close they got I varied the orbital inclination of the satellites. That is, are they going around like this in a coplanar merger? Are they going around like this at some relative inclination? And I varied the initial conditions of the simulated Milky Way galaxy because, of course, we don't know these things in detail. We don't know what the gas fraction was exactly. We don't know um, the details of you know, how much energy injection there was from supernovae, etc. And because this is a multi-dimensional parameter space, okay, the, you, know, you can vary, when you're doing these simulations, there are many things that you can vary. You can vary how massive the satellites are, how close they're getting. You can vary the details of the structure of the galaxy that you're simulating. So you have to ask the question, what is it that really matters in determining the fits to the data? What I'm showing here is a variance versus variance plot, where I'm plotting the uh, the uh, simulation minus data whole squared for the m equal to 1 Fourier amplitude on the x-axis, and the same, same thing, but the, all of the low-order Fourier modes from 1 through 4 on the y-axis. Because this is a variance versus variance plot, so it's simulation minus data whole squared on both axes. On such a plot, the best fits will be close to the origin, which are produced by a 1 to 100 mass ratio satellite that gets within seven kiloparsec of the galactic center. So the nomenclature here is the number before the R is the mass ratio of the satellite, the number after the R is the pericentric approach distance of the satellite in units of H inverse KPC. Um, the relative distance from the origin gives you a sense of how poor the fit is. So you can see from this that 
the perturbations that you see in the cold gas disk of our galaxy could not have been produced by a satellite that's as massive as a 1 to 10 mass ratio satellite. And this is consistent with analysis of the thickness of the stellar disk of our galaxy. Now, to assess the importance of uh, things like initial conditions, orbital inclinations, etc., you can hold the satellite mass and periscopic approach distance constant and vary everything else that might conceivably affect uh, the fit to the data. And that's what I mean by the variance of a given simulation. Like, for instance, you can vary the gas fraction, the equation of state, orbital velocity, etc. And these things have some effect, but they don't have a large effect. Okay? And they all cluster close together, and they all cluster close to the origin. So this shows you that it's not very sensitive to uh, initial conditions. So, you know, at this point, I'd made a pretty crazy prediction. You know, I'd said that there is a yet-to-be-discovered satellite of our own galaxy that is nearly as massive as the Large Magellanic Cloud, shown here. This is the Small Magellanic Cloud. These are galactic satellites that we do know about, okay? Um, and I predicted at what radius you would see it. So naturally after that I decided to get even crazier and I predicted uh, what azimuth you would see it and it's roughly here. So, you know, you have to ask the question, you know, you've made this crazy prediction, why haven't we seen it yet? There's a lot of dust in the plane of our galaxy, okay? So it's very difficult to look through the plane of our galaxy in the optical because of the huge amount of dust obscuration in the plane. There, there could be something that's very dim that is hidden in the plane of our galaxy. And if you were looking for something like this, if you were looking for a dim dwarf galaxy with very old stars that's close to the plane of our galaxy, you would do better to look in the infrared where uh, there, you suffer less from dust ex extinction. Now, earlier infrared surveys, um, like two mass, are not quite deep enough we submitted a proposal to look for this putative dwarf galaxy in um, the GLIMS survey uh, of the galactic plane. This is a survey that's been done by the Spitzer Space Telescope um, in the near infrared bands. And uh, GLIMS, along with another survey called UKIDS, should be sufficient to allow us to look for uh, this putative dwarf galaxy if it really is out there. Um, I wanted to make a very specific prediction in this case because I felt we stand to learn something, regardless of whether I'm right or wrong. Um, if I'm wrong, for instance, we can see how to improve the model further, and obviously if I'm right, then uh, I don't mind getting famous either. So uh, let me talk a little bit about uh, some recent work that I've done that uh, now builds on this um, sequence of papers where uh, we've been trying to characterize dark matter dominated dwarf galaxies by analyzing their gravitational effects on the outer gas disk of the spiral galaxy that they're interacting with. But now I, I want to learn something about the density distribution of dark matter in the larger primary spiral galaxy itself. Okay, so as I said, since the 70s, these flat rotation curves, okay, from the observations of these flat rotation curves, we inferred the existence of dark matter halos in galaxies. Okay, so you, know, you have this massive component that's making up, you have this dark matter that's making up most of the mass in, in a galaxy, and this is sort of like the stellar disk here. But we don't really know how the dark matter is distributed, okay? That is, is it sort of centrally condensed? You know, how is it actually distributed in detail? Simulations, theoretical simulations, suggest it should have a power law form, okay? The idea here in these uh, simulations is that the density of dark matter should go as r to the minus 1 for radii less than what's called a scale radius, and switch over and go as r to the minus 3 for radii greater than a scale radius. For a given mass halo, okay, specifying the scale radius specifies the density distribution of dark matter in this model. 
But this is a theoretical construct. This is an expectation. It doesn't really tell us, you know, if I were to point to a specific spiral galaxy over there, it doesn't tell us how to infer the scale radius of that specific spiral galaxy over there. So that's the question that I want to try and answer. How can we get the scale radius of a specific spiral galaxy? So now I'm going to build on the uh, previous results for the Whirlpool galaxy. I'm going to use our derived satellite mass and pericenter approach distance as input because we found these quantities to be observationally corroborated. Um, when we compare our derived satellite mass for M51, we see that that's in fact what the observers uh, also tell us, and it's in agreement with prior dynamical studies. And now I'm going to vary the density profile of dark matter in the larger primary spiral galaxy, which is equivalent to varying the potential depth. Okay, and you can imagine as you're varying the potential depth, it's going to change the resultant disturbances in the gas disk dramatically. So, uh, as you saw before, the density of dark matter goes as r to the minus 1 for radii less than the scale radius, and it goes as r to the minus 3 for radii greater than the scale radius. So these three cases I'm showing you go from a very large scale radius case to an intermediate scale radius case to a low scale radius case. If you have a very large scale radius, the density goes as r to the minus 1 all the way out to the extent of the gas disk. If you have a low scale radius, it switches over and follows the steeper r to the minus 3 profile in the region where you have the H1. And steeper density profiles are more effective at holding on to their stuff. And they produced more tightly wrapped spiral plan forms than shallower density profiles. And that's the transition that you're seeing here. You can express this more quantitatively by looking at what's called the phase of the M equal 1 mode for these different simulations. So I'm showing here the phase of the M equal 1 mode for the large scale radius case the low scale radius case, and the intermediate scale radius case, over plotted with the phase of the M equal 1 mode for the data for M51. And the data agrees most closely with the 17 kiloparsec case. But you can see these things have very different shapes. So what's going on here? You can understand this a little bit more physically by plotting the phase as a function of a dimensionless radius, that is R over RS. And you can see that interior to the scale radius the phase has a negative gradient. Exterior to the scale radius, the phase has a positive gradient. And there's a transition region close to the scale radius. So if you can construct atomic hydrogen maps of nearby spiral galaxies and observe this transition region, you can infer the scale radius of specific spiral galaxies and characterize the density distribution of dark matter in an observationally motivated way. In closing, um, I'll just say that this method that I and my collaborators are trying to develop, we've come to call it tidal analysis, it's very complementary to gravitational lensing. Both of these methods allow you to probe cold dark matter substructure and dark matter without relying on the stellar light distribution. So it's a means of mapping mass distributions without having to see the optical light. Uh, that they emit. And I'm going to go back to this old and inspiring example of the discovery of Neptune by Le Verrier. Now, of course, um, after the discovery of Neptune in the 1840s, Le Verrier became amazingly famous, and, and, and quite rightly so. Uh, unfortunately, he then went on to say that the perihelion precession of Mercury was due to a planet called Vulcan. Now, we may know better today, but you, know, you can't really blame the guy. At that time, he only had one solar system to test his theories on. Right? And when I think about the difference between then and now, what I'm really struck by is the explosion in data in the field of astronomy that gives theorists much better opportunities to test their models. 
So we're now planning on going back over all of the galaxies in the wonderfully named Thing Survey. There's some 40 galaxies in this Thing Survey. Many of them display perturbations on the outskirts. And we're going to test this method on this entire set to see if there's some appreciable fraction of false positives. That is, are these disturbances always due to external perturbers? Or could there be other effects that mimic this kind of thing? Okay, so that'll give us a way of assessing the statistical viability of this method. So let me go ahead and uh, summarize. Um, I find that analysis of perturbations in the cold gas on the outskirts of galaxies allows us to infer a number of things about galactic satellites, whether they're dark or luminous. Namely, we can figure out how massive they are and where they are in radius and azimuth. So this is a new method, essentially, to render effectively dark galaxies visible. We've tested this method by applying it to galaxies with optically visible companions that cover a wide range in perturber to primary spiral galaxy mass ratio. So from galaxies that have pretty low mass satellites to pretty massive satellites. And we find that it works over this wide range pretty well. Most recently, um, I've extended this to infer the density distribution of dark matter in the larger primary spiral galaxy itself. And by the way, the inference of 17 kiloparsec for the scale radius is actually consistent um, with expectations from theoretical simulations. Um, as I was saying earlier, you know, the 80s was really um, the decade for understanding the large-scale structure of the simulations, the structures that grew out of gravitational processes. But there are many things that go on in galaxies that can't be explained simply through gravity alone, things like um, baryonic processes, like cooling and feedback from supernovae. And we're starting to be able to model these things computationally. So I think you know, the next decade will be marked by a more detailed understanding of the guts of galaxy evolution, okay? modeling the details of galaxy evolution so that we can move from understanding the skeletal structure of the universe, which we do today quite well, to understanding the basic guts of galaxy evolution. Thanks for your attention.